All right, I am Ann Seymour. I am the director of the Office for Victims Crime Oral History Project. Steve Doreen, uh, executive director of the National Association of VOCA Assistance Administrators in Madison, Wisconsin. Steve, when, yeah. why, and how did you first get involved in the crime victims movement? Well, I got involved in the crime victims movement largely um, as a result of the work I was doing at the time in 1979. I was uh, director of research and information for the Wisconsin Department of Justice. And in that capacity was um, responsible for coordinating all of the department's legislative activity. And um, we were actually uh, asked as a department to um, um, take over administration of the state's crime victim compensation program. That program had been administered in the workers' compensation division. Um, and uh, a couple of events occurred. There was a study of that program um, that raised some serious questions about how it was being managed. Uh, there was a whistleblower who was uh, talking to some legislators about some of the problems. And the political environment at the time it was a Democratic legislature and a Republican administration. So the, the Democrats in the legislature were, frankly, hoping to use this as, as an example to embarrass some of the Republican appointees. Um, and they originally wanted to create a separate agency for victim compensation, but that was not going to pass, creating a new agency. So they looked around, and the only state agency headed by a Democrat was the Department of Justice. It was headed by a democratically elected uh, Attorney General Bronson LaFollette. So they came to us and said, you know, we want to transfer that program out. Would you take it? So we agreed to take it. And um, that really was my first introduction in terms of uh, handling the legislation. There were two bills. One uh, was to actually transfer uh, and revise the administrative structure of crime victim comp in, in the state. And uh, a sec second bill that would have made substantive programmatic changes. Um, there was a meeting with the legislators uh, where they asked us if we would take it over, and we agreed. And on the way out, uh, one of the two legislators, uh, she was then a, uh, a, a, in the state assembly named Barbie Lichney, sort of made an offhand comment. Um, oh, and by the way, there's another bill dealing with victims that we're going to give uh, your agency some more responsibilities. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that turned out to be the nation's first Bill of Rights for crime victims. And uh, frankly, in that session, the, the focus of attention, because of the political uh, controversy, focused on crime victim compensation. Victim rights and services, the Bill of Rights was, I don't want to say an afterthought, but it was sort of a secondary issue. Um, we didn't know at the time uh, what we were getting ourselves into with that. Um, so I got involved uh, initially in, in the uh, passage of, of the crime victim compensation uh, legislation and the uh, transfer of that program from, from one agency to ours. Um, subsequently in that session, um, the legislation creating a, a Bill of Rights came up. There was some controversy over that and um, some legislative activity, but ultimately passed. Now, that obviously turned to be a very significant piece of legislation, and it was instigated by um, the then head of the Milwaukee Victim Witness Program uh, that was run by the um, uh, Milwaukee District Attorney's Office, uh, Joe Beaudry at the time. She's Joe Kalanda now. And uh, through that process, uh, got to meet Joe, who became um, not only a very good friend, but uh, an inspiration and a mentor. Um, my role had always been sort of helping to facilitate legislation, more of a, almost as a mechanic, because uh, the ideas came from the people in the field, from Joe, Rich Anderson, who was appointed to head the crime victim compensation program in, in our department when we took it over. And because of the, the role of uh, Barb Ulishny in the legislature, first in the State Assembly and then the State Senate, we had uh, probably a decade of, of remarkable success in the legislature. Um, it was uh, uh, particularly the 83, 85 session. Uh, we would pass dozens of bills. And it was a very effective, uh, there was usually no opposition. Um, 
we almost got spoiled because it was so simple. You didn't, almost didn't have to work for the legislation. Um, and it was, it was through my association with them uh, that I became more involved in the administration of the programs. And um, ultimately, actually, uh, Rich had uh, sort of pressured me to attend a conference, NOVA conference in Jacksonville, Florida in 1983. And um, until that time, you know, victim issues, victim programs, I was very interested in it, but it was certainly not, you know, uh, the sum total of what I was doing. And I just became overwhelmed with the people, um, the cause. Uh, there were some other things going on, and I'm saying, why am I feeling sorry for myself? Look at what people are doing in this field. And, and just got sort of emotionally um, caught up in, in, in the people and the dedication and the services and mm -hmm. became more and more involved uh, professionally. Um, that's a really good segue, Steve, to our second question. When you first got into the, the victim's field, 1979, so almost 30 years ago, what was the field like nationally? You can talk about Wisconsin, too, because I think you all had a, a, some leadership role. But nationally, and include the context of the era, which was the, the 70s and early 80s. Well, um, Snapshot. Uh, when I first got involved, um, there had, as I said, uh, much of the focus early on was with compensation, compensation issues. And, and there were probably um, maybe 30 to 35 states that had comp programs. And those had been fairly well established, although it was starting to go through a, a, a genesis, I think, in terms of the philosophy, the scope, and the, and the purposes of victim compensation. Um, in Wisconsin and many other states, it had been sort of modeled after a workers' comp uh, approach. And the more we learned about victims and victim services, the more victim-oriented. And I think there were a lot of innovations that I think we in Wisconsin played around with as, as we were learning. Um, you know, we had, for example, uh, as many states did at the time, a, a restriction on uh, applications where the victim and the offender lived in the same household or had a sexual relationship. And largely because of Rich, and, and Rich had a background in law enforcement and investigation, he said, you know, the purpose of that was to prevent, you know, fraudulent claims. He says, it's almost impossible to create fraudulent claims. So we started exploring why do we have this. And so we would propose legislation to get rid of it. We didn't need it. I mean, the problems that we might have been addressing could have been addressed in other more straightforward ways. So we got rid of those things. And, and on the compensation side, I think we started to, to, to carve some new ground. Um, on the assistance side, um, as you know, the, the legislation we passed, uh, there had been no comparable legislation, because not only did it establish um, a, a, a statutory basis for victim rights, but it provided funding for services. And funding was one of the major reasons uh, for the legislation in, in a very real world sense. The funding for the Victim Witness Program in Milwaukee had run out. It was originally funded with some federal legislation. Mm -hmm. And then when that ran out, they were trying to keep it together with some you know, community um, <laughs> funding and stuff. And Joe thought, well, let's, let's ask the state to pick it up. And so the funding came through our department in our office. And, and when I went full time in 83 working for Victim Services, I was managing the, the Victim Witness Program. Now, from her point of view, it was wonderful because the original legislation called for the state to reimburse counties 100 percent. So it's sort of like, here's my bill, pay it. Um, and, but Joe's motivation was more than, than just protecting her program in Milwaukee because it provided for um, statewide services. And in, in that experience, we got into some political um, um, fights. Um, uh, when the legislation passed for victim witness services, the funding for that uh, program for the state to reimburse the counties, it was structured in such a way, Wisconsin is on a biennial budget basis, so every two years there's a new budget. And it was structured in such a way that the actual spending of state money to support local programs wouldn't have begun until the last two months of the biennium, which I believe was about $200,000. When our agency had to put together our budget for the next biennium, we had to establish what the base was. And we said, well, $200,000 was for two months, 
So for the 24 months of the next biennium, we needed, I believe, $2,400,000. Well, the governor and his administration said, no, your base is going to be $200,000, and if you want to ask for another $2 million, you'll have to take that as a request to increase funding. And in the political environment, then, the, the, the attorney general, who's an elected position, didn't want to be accused of being a big spender that we were asking for all this additional money. So there was a big brouhaha, a lot of uh, public attention, and in the midst of which NOVA had given the state an award for having passed this legislation. And that award was, was made right in the middle of this local controversy over uh, accusing the governor of trying to gut victim programs, the governor accusing the attorney general of being a big spender, and here comes NOVA praising the state uh, for the great work. And the governor, at first threatened to not accept the NOVA award. And uh, ultimately, we, we reached a compromise uh, on the funding issue by uh, limiting the number of counties uh, that could be eligible for state funding. And I negotiated with some of the people as to how many counties would be of, uh, entitled to state funding in those first couple of years. I think we had 12, uh, actually 13. Uh, we ended up with 12 because I went to speak to one county board, and after they heard me speak, they decided not to have a program, which shows you what an effective advocate I was. <laughs> um, and so there was a cap on the number of, of programs that could get state funding the first couple of years. And subsequently, um, we developed a proposal for additional funding. This was, again, in the early 80s. Um, and we, we followed the, the, the lead of law enforcement trainers. Uh, law enforcement training throughout the country that had received federal funding uh, began creating what they call penalty assessments to provide the funds to replace lost federal funds for police training. So I used that and, uh, and uh, proposed legislation to create a victim witness surcharge to supplement state tax dollars for victim services. And that additional funding was used as the financial rationale to um, eliminate this limit on the number of counties. Um, the surcharge, uh, w when we were considering it, um, the, the law enforcement penalty assessment for training was a percentage of, of the amount of fines, uh, traffic citations, so it was a percentage of, um, uh, of a monetary penalty. And we thought, as we were thinking through the, the victim witness uh, surcharge, that actually most of the criminal cases, particularly the more serious cases, there wasn't going to be a fine. That, you know, somebody's going to be incarcerated. And so there's no fine uh, levied so that we couldn't attach a percentage of that fine. And we thought it was just as a matter of equity, everybody should be paying. Certainly those who um, uh, committed more serious crimes should be paying. So instead of a percentage, we, we structured it so that it was a flat amount. And originally it was $30 per felony count and $20 per misdemeanor count. Um, and um, uh, the reason it was per count was I had learned through uh, some other, um, actually we did some Medicaid fraud cases and uh, they would pile on counts. I mean, you could have charged uh, seven counts in a case. I remember putting out a press release for one Medicaid fraud case where it was 350 counts. Mm -hmm. When I looked at the case, I said, you know, this should be seven counts. You know, it's just how you want to divide it up. I thought, well, that's a good way of increasing the money by doing it per count rather than per case. Uh, so it was $30 per felony count, um, $20 per misdemeanor count. And um, shortly after that, there was a case in Milwaukee after it went into effect, and there was a defendant convicted of, uh, of homicide. And he was sentenced to life. And when the judge asked him, you know, do you have anything to say, the guy said, well, you know, I understand the sentence, but what's the $30, you know? And so we started calling it life plus $30. <laughs> and um, the other interesting part about that, I think, is when we first proposed this, and uh, it was, you know, something that, that hadn't really been um, used before, uh, there was very little basis to, to do some financial projections, we actually entered into a a, a discussion with some of the budget people who wanted to say we would not generate any money because defendants are poor and uh, this is not going to work. And 
since then, I think uh, many states have used use similar types of revenue, and we generate in Wisconsin, um, you know, over a million dollars that go to support these services. The other thing we put in, uh, which I thought was a, a, a nice little feature of it, was that uh, in, uh, persons who are incarcerated who did not pay that surcharge would have that amount deducted from their inmate wages. That, that, that there would be a, a, a funding stream. Are so. the first state to do that, the inmate wage deduction or trust account deduction? Uh, um, I, w I would think we probably were, because I don't know that, um, we, and we, I think we were probably the first state to even have any kind of a surcharge for victim services, because as I, uh, uh, now making that assumption, does. because that was based on the law enforcement training funding, and, and Certainly in those days, not very many states had even um, created state funding for, for lo local services. But um, I know you are known in a lot of pioneering areas in the field, but I really want you to tell the story of the uh, planning and passage of the Victims of Crime Act of 1984 that a lot of people have talked about throughout this oral history project as being pretty meaningful to the field. Well, I, I think VOCA obviously was very significant. And, um, you know, I, my involvement in terms of the, you know, the conception and the drafting was largely, I guess, in, in two related capacities. One was uh, working through the Attorney General in Wisconsin and doing the legislation for that department and having um, worked on the legislation in the state. So when it came time for uh, a federal victim uh, legislative initiative, um, I was pretty active. And that was um, on behalf of the Attorney General, but also at, at, at the initiation, I guess you'd say, of NOVA. Um, uh, we had, a, a, and I'd say NOVA and the National Tur uh, Association of Attorneys General, NAG. Um, because there was a natural interest by the attorneys general um, in the legislation. And, and what year was this that you were just starting this would to have, Well, it would have been 80, probably if maybe late 83, early 84. It, it, uh, um, you know, uh, at the time, uh, you know, this was a, a new idea came out of the 82 uh, task force. Subsequently, the work I did with OVC in terms of uh, doing the report to Congress uh, and researching some things that I didn't necessarily know at that time that it was happening that, you know, the real interest at the federal level uh, for many years had been strictly in the, the development of a federal crime victim compensation program. As Ralphie Allborough from Texas had introduced in almost every year, I think since 76 or something like that, uh, legislation to create a federal crime victim compensation program. So that really was, the, the, on the federal level, the historical pre, uh, precedence to it. The idea of, of, of attaching support for victim assistance programs came out of the President's Task Force in 82. And so those two things sort of combined um, to create what ultimately became VOCA. And so as, as part of a team, um, as I said, largely through through um, NOVA and through the uh, Attorney General's organization. You know, there are a lot of different versions and proposals. Um, you know, we would we would uh, work on those. Um, there were who, some. Who were your patrons in Congress? Did you have any guardian angels? Well, uh, John Hines certainly was a major supporter of it. Um, you know, P um, uh, Peter Rodino, um, on the House side, was chair of the Judiciary Committee. I, since then, have used the example, to me, of the victim's field from a political science perspective. So, um, you know, the, the political forces, I, th I think it's a fa fascinating political study of, um, of extremes. Uh, because on, on the Senate side, uh, the sponsor was Strom Thurmond. Uh, although, that, you know, that was the administration bill. That was... Uh, you know, Lois Harrington's bill and, uh, she, you know, on behalf of the administration, but it was Senator Thurman who introduced it. So when it ultimately passed, and I kept describing it as the Thurman-Rodino bill, 
I mean, you can't, couldn't get any further on along the spectrum. You know, we didn't have problems with the ends. It's always that mushy middle that we, we sometimes have problems with. And so I think a lot of the work, and, and I can't say that I had ongoing continuous contact personally with, with uh, the legislators, although I did with some of their staff. Uh, there was a Tom Hutchinson who worked for Senator, or for Representative Rodino. Um, actually, he had actually had come from Wisconsin. So, um, you know, it, it, there was a lot of negotiation. And the process itself was not a typical process of developing legislation because you, we didn't have a, a Senate bill that passed and then a House bill that passed and then a conference committee. Uh, so there was a lot of informal negotiation. As, as I recall, it was ultimately, you know, the Senate passed and the House passed and then they came to an agreement and each House uh, passed an agreed version so it didn't go to conference. And so even today the history is somewhat confused because uh, you could look at different interpretations of provisions. And, um, and so um, there was, a, um, in October of 84, when the legislation was on the floor of the Senate, NOVA convened a group of people, about 20 or so, from various states um, for a, a multi-day session in um, the Early Foundation in Virginia. And we were all camped out there in, in bunks like and it was raining and foggy and we would be huddled in, in, in a room and um, and we keep getting report telephone reports as to what was going on in, in, in the Senate and uh, we would f try to feedback things and uh, you know uh, I think there's several f items of VOCA that came out of that session that was significant. Um, one was um, at the time, VOCA, as it was drafted at that time, um, really was intended, and I think this was the, the vision of, of uh, the administration, and um, was really meant to sustain the existing programs, the community-based programs. You know, the vision I had in mind were, you know, the people who gather around the table trying to, you know, do bake sales to sustain their services. And, uh, and I remember hearing Lois Harrington talking about we wanted to provide them so they didn't have to worry from year to year how they were going to sustain their services. Um, and some of the early drafts of the legislation actually would have limited funding to existing programs. And I think the, the, the theory was there were other funding sources that would start up new programs and VOCA would sustain them. And um, a fellow at the time for, um, who was direct, worked for the Department of Public Safety in South Carolina, Richie Tidwell, who's now a consultant. And, and because of his relationship with uh, Senator Thurman coming from South Carolina was influential. I actually raised, I remember him raising the issue, well, there's so little services in this country, we should be using some of this money uh, to start up new programs. And um, I think that idea carried through. The, the form in which it was carried through, uh, it got changed a lot. and. Um, um, it's hardly recognizable, but the idea that VOCA was meant to sustain uh, programs as well as expand um, came out of that, that discussion. The other thing that happened there uh, was we got word uh, through John Stein that Senator Specter was going to introduce an amendment that the VOCA funding would uh, give priority to victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse. Up until that point, VOCA, the victim assistance, uh, there w it was a it was meant to support all s services for all victims. And there was, I think, a very strong feeling that we shouldn't be picking and choosing among groups. So we heard that Senator Specter was going to introduce this floor amendment, which he did. And I think uh, the people at that group tried to, you know, maintain the spirit of uh, that it should be available to all. And um, the word we got back, uh, you know, through John, who was in contact with Senator Specter's staff, which I remember to this day, was, don't worry, I'll take care of it, which was sort of like, you know, the death knell, you know, and ultimately we, that amendment passed and we have the priority uh, requirements of VOCA. Um, um, just real briefly, what, what's, and it probably sounds like a stupid question, what's the impact of VOCA on the field? Almost, it's been almost 20 years, I wonder. Well, I can tell you the impact uh, uh, right away because you know um, 
shortly after that, I, I worked as a consultant to OVC in um, doing the first, their first report to Congress. And so was really able to, to take a look nationally as to what VOCA did. And um, on the compensation side, uh, and compensation was an easier program to measure at the time, it really um, created an impetus far beyond the dollars that it provided to the states. Um, there were some requirements that states had to um, meet in order to get VOCA dollars, such as covering non-residents and stuff like that, that I think with maybe one exception, every state, you know, uh, broadened their, their requirements. Um, so not only were states able to award more money because of the federal money, but um, I remember researching uh, dozens and dozens of improvements in programs because what VOCA did was it served as the attention getter. It helped to educate people. In, uh, in Wisconsin, um, and I think we were the only state to do this, and I don't know that it was a good idea, but we put together a package of legislation. Um, I can give you a brief story. Um, there was legislation introduced uh, by the local MAD chapter to uh, cover victims of drunk driving under a compensation program. And I remember Rich did a wonderful fiscal note to show that this was not going to be as costly as many people thought. And um, I was working with them on the legislation. And uh, the ch chapter head of MAD at the time, Mickey Sadoff, who subsequently became president of MAD nationally, we were working together on it. Mm -hmm. And it was going through OK. And all of a sudden, the legislation just got stopped. And we couldn't figure out why. And then I learned there was one Republican legislator, uh, and they were in the minority at the time, but he was able to just put the, the brakes on this legislation. And I knew him pretty well. We always disagreed, but we were always able to talk and debate things. So I went to him, and I asked him what the problem was. And he said that he had a real problem with the way MAD was lobbying on a separate piece of legislation, and he didn't want to get, let it go through. And he also, he was sort of an intellectual sort of guy. He, he had reasons, philosophical reasons, as to why the state should be paying for victims. Wisconsin at the time allowed victims of Wisconsin residents who were victimized in other states that didn't have programs to collect under Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. He says, if we have a duty to protect, well, why should we be protecting if other states, why should we be paying if other states fail in their duty? You know, and he started raising these philosophical problems. And uh, I said, you know, you know, those are very legitimate issues. I, you know, but really, they deserve serious study. And if you let this bill go through, we will study it. We will have, we'll invite you in. We have an advisory committee, and you can talk to us, and we can discuss these philosophical. So he did, and the bill went through. And I carried through on, on the promise. And his name was Dave Prosser. Um, and Dave Prosser is now on our state Supreme Court. Um, uh, and we invited him in, and he gave his, his, his dissertation. And this committee that listened to him listened politely and went on to recommend a whole big package of expansion of the Crime Victim Comp program. And they used the, fourth, the money that was coming from VOCA as the financial base to justify expanding this program, the program that he really was questioning. But we called it the Prosser Committee. So he was virtually the only one to vote against the package of improvements that came out of the Prosser Committee. Um, and they funded it strictly from VOCA. So in that case, we had a situation where we could point directly to how um, VOCA caused the expansion of benefits, uh, because it was funded directly from that. Um, on the assistance side, um, it was a little bit more difficult to sort of quantify and, and point to uh, some of the benefits because on the assistance side um, there were about I think 1,500, 2,000 programs that were getting um, VOCA funding. Uh, there wasn't the time, uh, at least when I was looking at it then, to really uh, quantify. I do know that one of the immediate impacts was in some states that had no victim services at all. And I think of Arizona, for example. I remember uh, surveying the states, and, and the response from states like Arizona was, we wouldn't have anything in, in our state if it weren't for VOCA. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it was not only the federal money 
it was not only that financial resource, it was identifying people in the state, it was a political um, recognition of victim services. And, and so I see VOCA not only has it expanded significantly by the, the distribution of money, but it has served as a you know, sort of a focal point. Um, and I think it's viewed um, to a large extent as a, as a federal state partnership. Uh, when it was passed in 84, um, it was you know, the only new spending program Congress passed in that session. Um, it was during the Reagan administration which was touting its new federalism. And, and I don't know about other parts of federal government, but, and I don't know whether this ended up being good or bad, but in OVC they believed in that. And on the assistance side, they've given states a lot of discretion. And they've, uh, I think the two facets of, that are important was that they gave states a lot of discretion to meet the needs of that state, and it believed in direct services, sometimes too much, sometimes to the extent of jeopardizing quality services. One of the early arguments we had when OVC, when Justice Department was developing guidelines was getting them to allow us to use VOCA funding for training people. And uh, they were so focused on direct services that there sometimes wasn't the appreciation that there's a need to support services, to have quality services. And today, uh, when we have seen years in which almost a billion dollars has been collected, uh, and we're going from the early days of sixty million dollars to you know half a billion or more um, I think there is a, still a concern um, of who we're sending out in the field what is their quality of training their capability I think we've been very lucky that we haven't had the horror stories that could have occurred and it only take I think we learned this with LEA programs it only takes one or two stories in newspapers to create a negative impression and if we're not able to maintain the quality control uh, of the people we're, at, we're funding out in the field, the possible damage that somebody could do to a victim if they're providing services, whether it's under state or federal money, is, is a very real threat and I think we've been very lucky to date that we haven't had that kind of horror story um, and I think a lot of the work that's being done through the National Victim uh, Academy and other things at the state and local level are essential. Uh, we, I think we need, personally, I think we need to uh, solidify some of that. Um, it's still ad hoc, and I'm not trying to say we should centralize it, but we need to know the level of quality of who we're sending out in the field to, to work with victims. And that's, that's one of my two major uh, concerns right now with the victims field. Save that for when we ask you about your major concerns of the victim field. <laughs> Remember I, I, that. I intentionally stopped um, Give me, point. I know you have already <laughs> described so many tactics and strategies, and, and give me one strategy that historically you have used to be successful in your agency, one, one approach that just was good, secret, tactic. Um, well, in terms of legislation, public policy, as I, as I said earlier, I think we were very lucky. We were very fortunate. Um, we had, you know, an iron triangle that was just impenetrable uh, for, for over 10 years. Uh, so one of our strategies, you know, was, was, you know, just giving it to the right person mm -hmm. in terms of legislation. Um, and sometimes it was done, um, uh, uh, Joe Bodry and I talk about the time we were working on legislation for what is generally known as victim impact statements. Uh, we don't call them victim, we, we, we do now, but early years we couldn't call them victim impact statements because when I was talking to the Attorney General about it, he got really upset because he was thinking they're going to be treated like environmental impact statements. Mm -hmm. You know, and whenever somebody wants to do something and there's environmental impact statement, it ends up in court and stuff like that. So I went back, rewrote it, and we, we, we didn't refer to it as victim impact statements. And because of this sort of uh, lack of support for the concept, I was a little limited in my role. So Joe and I used to kid around about these drafts of legislation just sort of floating down from the transom <laughs> in, in, in the offices. So I was actually drafting them, but I had to sneak them around. I think um, 
uh, unlike other states, and, and maybe this is revealing a secret, um, the progress that was made, uh, particularly in the victim rights and services field that were perhaps more system-based because we were in the Department of Justice and we were working very closely, our history, our relationships, our inspirations came from people working in victim witness programs as opposed to, say, domestic violence programs. Um, it was more system-driven. I mean, we, we might have used individual citizens, individual victims in specific cases, but we never had the kind of broad base umbrella organizations that you see in other states, the COVAs and the MOVAs, and maybe because we thought WOVA didn't sound very good, but it was, it was really a handful of people who, who cre created the momentum, the ideas, and the implementation. And we, I think we paid a price for that as well, because when those people left, we didn't leave the infrastructure to maintain the mm -hmm. progress. And we didn't have, you know, there were a lot of people, we, we passed a constitutional amendment with 84% mm -hmm. of the vote, but it wasn't because we necessarily had this groundswell of citizen grassroots support. Um, and we, we did a lot. I don't know that uh, we would have accomplished as much if we had approached it in a different political way. I don't know that we had any choice. Um, but as I said, I think there were some downsides in terms of um, the long term. So in terms of secrets and stuff, it was, for, particularly in the 80s, it was a pretty closed um, number of people. I mean, we, we listened to people. We would work with MAD and others on a, on a sort of case-by-case -case basis, but we didn't have that uh, grassroots, broad-based uh, coalition. Um, one kind of exception to that was with sexual assault. And sexual assault, as well as victim services, in some ways became sort of a special focus because uh, our legislative mentor, Barb Ulichny, actually got into the issue um, before she was in the legislature. She had worked as uh, in the mid-'70s um, for a coalition that rewrote uh, the state sexual assault laws. And she was working for the YWCA at the time and was part of a, of a coalition to do that. So she had a particular interest in, in sexual assault issues. We did a lot of legislation on that and ultimately uh, led to um, the establishment of funding for sexual assault. But in those years, VOCA was the principal source of funding sexual assault services because Barbara was also the chair of our advisory committee. Um, so, um, you know, I wish we had some deep dark secrets, other, but it, frankly it was so easy. <laughs> uh, we didn't need many. It was, uh, you know, just just tell them what they what we wanted, and it was done. Um, how about have there been or are there any failures that you can identify in our field, either back then or now? Or um, I don't want to say I don't want to label it a failure because I don't know that it's over. Um, I can think of two things and maybe they're related and I'm approaching it um, in a political context. Um, I think there's a perception that the victim's movement is this monolithic, powerful monolithic, I think some people almost feel demagogic movement, you know. You can't beat up, you can't criticize crime victims and stuff like that. And maybe that's true, maybe it's a facade. I don't know. But I, I feel the work you know, that we've been doing with uh, NVCAN and, um, and, and some of those broader issues, I don't think we've galvanized uh, a true grassroots, broad-based understanding of, of victims' issues. I think that's our failure. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this. Um, uh, a lot of times we talk to ourselves. Um, I think there's a compelling case to be made, but I don't know, at least maybe others feel differently. I don't feel like we've made it. And I think an example of this, just to, to crystallize it, is, you know, several years ago, um, I was having dinner with Carolyn Hightower, and she just said, Steve, why don't we have a march on Washington? for victims. She said that to me last night, too. 
And um, it was sort of like a great idea, but I feel, and maybe it's just my antenna, I don't know that we could pull it off. I don't know that while people can, you know, um, you know, say nice things. I don't know that we have the that broad-based political, that um, uh, the critical point yet where people that haven't experienced mm -hmm. it or haven't been involved involved in the field get it the way they might with mm -hmm. women's issues, um, environmental mm -hmm. issues. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to call it a failure because I don't think it's over. I don't think we can, I think that's mm. still one of the challenges, but that's my visceral feeling. Um, the other one, um, and, and I think it's connected to that, um, has to do with um, getting people to understand to, to um, give more than lip service to the idea of victim rights. Um, and, and this may be a cultural issue. We've, mm -hmm. we've talked about it in terms of the legal system. And again, I'll, I'll go back to some recent reactions I had to the, the issue of the Constitutional Amendment where when it was being debated on the floor of the Senate, I just sort of listened to the people who were our friends, mm -hmm. the Schumers and the Leahy's and the Kennedy's. Um, and I'm saying, you know, these are our friends, not our enemies. We haven't gotten this across to them. Part of it, again, I think is maybe a political dynamic because the people on that side of the spectrum that I identify with, uh, it's almost like crime victims mm -hmm. as a term suggests in a political context, Republican, conservative, hard on crime. And to the liberals, uh, if we talk women, children, and, and, and minorities, they're not will it doesn't sink in. And so it's cutting through some of those uh, stereotypes, those preconceptions. And to me, I think it's, it's got to be a visceral thing. Uh, we've allowed sometimes the arguments to be made too cerebral, particularly when we're dealing with legal arguments. And, um, and maybe those are all connected. Maybe it's just getting that point across in an effective way that gets people in their heart rather than their head. Can I take a break? Sure. I, that's a great one to ask okay. you. All right. And anytime. Rolling. Wonder, what do you perceive to be the one greatest accomplishment that has promoted victims' issues, victims' needs, victims' rights? The one greatest accomplishment? Ooh. Um, I, I, my answer, I don't know that it's in terms of accomplishments. I think a force um, that I've seen um, <coughs> throughout my involvement um, has been NOVA. I, I think NOVA uh, certainly was um, one of my early uh, entrees into learning, into meeting, into networking. Uh, as an institution, uh, as an umbrella organization, not just NOVA itself for what it does and its mm -hmm. functions, but as, 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 as an umbrella group, as a forum for meeting people, um, for disagreeing with people, working things out. Um, I, I don't believe uh, VOCA would have ever gotten off the ground if it were not for NOVA. Um, and certainly, uh, it, it it was a common thread throughout, the, you know, since the, the mid '70s. Um, and it's not a history of Nova, but I think that's the one constant factor that 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 uh, that's been present in the constitutional amendment and bulk, bulk of funding and training and crisis response and um, and it's the maybe it's the idea of Nova as much as it is the the organization. Um, but that, to me, is something I keep coming back to. I mean, that seems to be home base for a lot of things that have happened. Um, what's needed today to continue the growth and professionalism of our field, 30 years into the field? Mm 
Well, I guess I look at it in two, two, two ways. One is services, uh, the, the direct services, the quality services, and I've mentioned this before. I think we need to get our act together in some way or, or various ways, but in some cohesive way to assure quality services to victims that, that, that virtually every dollar that goes out, 90% of every dollar that's used is for people. Um, and we need to ensure the quality um, of the people, their training. Um, and this is a direct service. This is a human service field. Um, and I, I, I think we've passed the time when we've really had to come to grips with that. We, we, uh, you know, we don't want to discourage volunteers and, and, and others who don't have a lot of initials after their names. I'm not suggesting we do, but when it comes to providing one-on-one -on -one services, um, we need to know who's out there and who's, who knows what they're doing. And I've always said one of the best contributions I've made to victim services is I know I'm not a direct service provider. And so I, I'll <laughs> refrain from that. And I think others may need to, to realize that themselves. The other area, I think, is in the area of rights. And it's, it's, it's a cultural issue. It's, it's emotional. It's not just illegal. It's not just rights and, and legislation. And I won't repeat what I'm sure others have said about you know, laws and statutes. And, you know, I've worked on statutes, I've worked on state constitutional amendments, I'm working on constitutional amendments, but I still think what we're trying to do is we're dealing with attitudes. And uh, you don't need a law, you don't need a constitution to say be nice to someone. Uh, but that's what we've had to do. And I think until we can get behaviors changed, cultures changed, and this is particularly I'm thinking in terms of the legal profession, uh, and make this, you know, uh, uh, a non-issue. Um, I, I think we've got to cut into that, that cultural uh, mindset. Word of advice to the Buffalo Chips and Nickels, the newbies to the field of which there are many, from someone who's been in the field almost 30 years. Well, I th I, 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 there's a lot of advice. I, um, I think in terms of people entering the field, uh, you and I, I think, I discovered it when we were doing State Victim Academy, and we did, because we're proud of our history in the state, and we did some sections on, on the history of victim rights generally in Wisconsin, and I think you told me, you know, some of the students there were amazed at, at what went on. And uh, I think there needs to be an understanding that, uh, that this is part of a cause, it's part of a movement. Things went on before, but they have a responsibility to continue and, and, and to, to help Keep, keep understanding the roots, and that doesn't mean you got, you're stuck in the past, but that's a very important movement. I think this project is going to contribute to that, and uh, it, it, it reinforces the commitment and the dedication of people that you're not out there alone. A lot of people in the field are work independently, and it, you need to know you're part of something that's bigger. And I would say, you know, understand that the, the important role that they're playing and the contribution they can make. Vision for the future. Vision. What's your vision thing, Wonder? I. Um, I, I don't know that I have a, a, a short answer to that. Um, I mean, I feel, uh, if, if anything, maybe it's to keep doing what we're doing. I, I think we're on the right track. I, I think, you know, we're not, uh, we're learning, we're growing. Uh, there's a lot of things that are maturing in this field. Uh, it's 20, 30 years old, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're not even middle age yet, and I don't think we should get more of under about it. But, um, I think there's a lot of magic in the field, and um, we need to continue that. I think we need to nourish new ideas, and I'm not sure all buffaloes have new ideas, but I think uh, mm -hmm. we need to nourish that. I think we need to, I'll repeat what I said, you know, be concerned with quality and professionalization. Um, I don't have a short answer as, as to how to do that. I think a lot of things have to contribute to that, and I think we need uh, to get a sense um, that we're all on the same side in this field, you know, um, 
and we're working together. And I think the need for uh, you know diversity and for differences of opinions, but for, for us to realize we're we're all working toward the same goal. And I think that'll help nourish the future for victim services. But your greatest fear, or do you have a greatest fear? Um, I think my greatest fear is that it'll be taken for granted. And now maybe that's an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, maybe that's what we're really striving for, that this is second nature, everything. But I think, I, mean, I don't believe that'll happen, but I think it'll, it'll um, uh, you know, it, it, maybe in some sense that means we've succeeded, but I don't know that, um, mm. that, that we'll see that. Um, uh, it's been a good run, and, and, and I guess in the social political context, uh, we need to maintain our interest and our focus on it. Mm. Um, you, w one of the threads in your answers today, if I'm interpreting correctly, is that, that uh, the field of victims' rights or, or issues of victims' rights, specifically to a degree services, um, that can get political. Can you just talk about that? Because you really, it's been a thread of your conversation with me today. That it could, it is political. Uh, uh, How I mean, and why and just, I mean, you're, you've really been involved in a policy level. Over 25 years you've been involved. What's up with that? Um, well, I think any social movement, any cause is political. Uh, not necessarily, you know, in a partisan sense, perhaps, but not, and this uh, this has been a strange, you know, partisan field. You've been talking yeah. talking about partisanship in a lot of your answers. Well, I think what I've been, uh, I don't think so much partisanship, in, in, in some ways ideological maybe. Okay. Uh, not Republican, Democrat, but, you know, liberal, conservative, right, wrong. And I don't think it's, it's universal. Um, I think there are people who get it and people who don't. Um, and, uh, I mean, uh, uh, speaking for myself, um, victim rights, victim services, to me, is not an either-or game. I believe, you know, in, in we, we have different names for different theories of justice, you know. Um, you know, restorative justice, retributive justice, parallel justice, regurgitative <laughs> justice, you know, and I thought, well, why isn't there just justice? I mean, I had justice for you know, the accused. I don't have any problems with defendants' <coughs> rights for victims. It's part of the, the, if you look at a lot of victim services, and, and this is not to say every individual, everybody's free to have their own experiences and reactions without being judgmental, but from a public policy perspective, the responsibility is to try to achieve justice. And I have a, a, a quote I took from the President's Task Force, mm -hmm. you know, justice is the closest thing to doing what is right. Mm -hmm. And you could do right for lots of people. It doesn't mean everybody wins. And much of the public policy, maybe 90 percent of what we advocate in terms of victim rights, they're right, you know, they're procedural rights. Nobody has a right to a particular outcome, say, in a criminal justice. Their participatory rights, their rights to be heard, it doesn't dictate the outcome, but it does dictate the process. And and um, there are different views. So uh, to me, it's it's inclusionary, not exclusionary. I have a hard time understanding those of our friends who don't understand that. Uh, but to me, including everyone benefits the whole society, the whole system, and it's not a, a, a either or game. So um, I guess that's what I mean in terms of the, the ideology. Uh, um, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about NAVAA, which you have to just tell us briefly about, but also what, it, what those initials mean. NAVAA is National Association of VOCA Assistance Administrators. It's the as an organization, as an entity, it's, it's very young. It's less than a year old, and it represents the uh, uh, forum for those at the state, uh, the 56 jurisdictions that administer VOCA assistance grants in those jurisdictions. Why'd you set it up? Why'd you see a need? Well, um, it, it was something that had been discussed for many, many, many years. I would say there are two immediate things that uh, caused me to believe it was time for this organization, and this has to do with politics, I guess, was the issues on 
the availability of VOCA funding and, and the recent caps that Congress placed on how much was being distributed to the states. And as it works out, you know, VOCA assistance grants are at the bottom of the food chain there, so any limitations are felt in support for, for the state assistance grants. And the other major thing that sort of clicked in my mind that says we need to get our act together was the reorganization for the Office of Justice Programs, where victims were totally not at the table. They didn't even know there was a table out there. You know, and I thought, you know, we needed something to get the views of this part of the, oh, the, uh, the victim assistance field, uh, give them a forum. We also tried to uh, provide technical assistance support help new administrators. I think uh, uh, we, we need to bring people on. I was talking about this yesterday at a workshop that you know, maybe part of our responsibility is to acculturate new mm -hmm. administrators to the fact that we're not just grant managers, that we need to be victim-oriented and, and victim advocates in carrying out our responsibilities well, as a grant manager. I, I was in the workshop, Steve, and um, there was some dissension about that. There was one VOCA person saying, I'm not an advocate, and a lot of other people physically recoiling at that statement. Well, I mean, what's your take on that? I think that's a really important issue for your specific niche of the field. Yeah. I, I, think may, I think that's a, a semantic difference. Um, uh, and, and the individual, if we sat down more, would agree. I mean, okay. it, it's what you want to call it uh, and how you, you manifest that in carrying out your jobs. But it's being victim sensitive and understanding the purpose of the program you're managing. And it's not a matter of you fight everybody all the time. Um, it's not an advocate in the way a lawyer is an advocate, you know, where you represent your client, whether they're guilty or innocent. But it's pushing for your program and, and understanding the core purpose of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And it's not simply to make sure the boxes are checked, but to serve victims. I, I have one final question, but his answer might be a little long. What do I got? Sure. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. You and Joe Beaudry had an awful lot to do with the um, idea of a, a national oral history project for the victim assistance field. Could you just give me your perspective? Because everyone's been asking, how'd you come up with this idea? Yeah, we had. A, we want to come up with something to keep you busy. <laughs> 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 I think it just came out. We were in in Mequon, Wisconsin. You, me, and Joe, and we were telling stories and. I think you and I were talking uh, on the way back to your hotel that we really need to capture this stuff, that we're all getting old and suffering from dementia, and if we don't start doing this pretty soon, we're going to lose out on a wealth of uh, information and, and experience. 